chapter 12. And we are going to look at one verse in Romans 12. We're going to start with one verse. Romans 12 and verse 11. If you can, let's stand together as we read this verse. Romans 12 and verse 11. It says, Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Let's pray together this morning. Father, as we come now to your word, I pray that a spirit of surrender would come on this church, on your people, Lord. As we've sang about it and laying our life on the altar without reservation, without holding anything back, I pray, God, that that would be a true statement, that we could sing without hypocrisy, that we could sing it and not have a part where we're holding back. And, Lord, I pray this morning that you would anoint me, anoint me, God, Lord, anoint the ministry of your word. Let there be a spiritual power here this morning that people would know that you're speaking, that you're ministering. God, touch our hearts this morning, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This morning I want to preach to you on that word that we see there, fervent, fervent, fervent. As is typical for the Apostle Paul, he has laid out for us his doctrine in the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. He's laid out for us what it is we are to believe. He's laid out how it is we are to think. There's also, there's also instructions within those verses or within those chapters. But as you come to chapter 12, in Romans chapter 12, you see explicitly how it is we are to live how you are to live your life, how it is you are to conduct yourself in this world as a Christian. And he begins in Romans 12 in verse 1, and you know this verse by heart or you should know it by heart. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He begins by saying that you are to present your life as a living sacrifice. That is, it is all on the altar, right? It's all at His disposal. It is a living sacrifice. It's all laid out for Him. You are to present your body. Just like the Old Testament offering, when they would come and present an offering, it would be presented before the Lord. You are to come before the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. Here is my life. This is my, I present my body to you as a living sacrifice. You're not your own anymore, right? Once you bring an offering to the altar, it's no longer yours anymore, right? You've given it to the Lord. Your life is not your own. Then he says in verse 2 that we are not to be conformed to this world, but we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we are not to be brought into the pattern of the world, into the mold of the world, that we are not to pattern ourselves after the world. We're not to look like the world, think like the world, live like the world, have the same attitude of the world. We're not to be conformed to it. The same value system, the same lifestyle, you ought to look totally different from the world if you belong to Jesus. Amen? Amen? Not to be conformed, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind is transformed. It's renovated. How you think, how you process things, how you take in information. It's renewed by the Word of God. It's renewed by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. He tells us, 
Then in verse 3, how we are to think of ourselves, not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, but to think soberly as God has given to every man a measure of faith. And then he goes on in verse 4 and he talks about how we are a part of the body and how we are to use our gifts, how we are to benefit the body, how we are to prophesy in proportion to our faith, how we are to lead with diligence and all of those things, how we are gifted. Then he comes to verse 9 and he says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. We are to love that is without hypocrisy. That's, that means with sincerity. You are to love each other with a sincere heart. Right? Sincere. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, hate what is evil, and cling to what is good. Verse 10 he says... Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. And as we are told to love each other, we are to be filled with brotherly love, kindness, and affection. We're to give honor to each other as those. We're to be a community of people. This is how we are to be a community of people who have crucified the flesh, who have crucified that besetting sin that we call selfishness, and we live for the benefit of one another. Amen? And then Paul comes to verse 11, and he makes this statement. He says, not lagging in diligence. The King James says, not slothful in business. Just not speaking about secular work here. It's talking about your service for the Lord, not slothful in business. The ESV says, do not be slothful in zeal. The NASV says, not lagging behind in diligence. As we see from God's Word, I got two points that you see in this text. And I don't think it can be any more simp simple than this within these two points. Here's point number one. Number one, you are not to be slothful serving God. You are not to be slothful serving God. Not lagging in diligence, not slothful, and not lazy when it comes to serving God. This carries with it this idea of indifference, this idea of carelessness, this, this idea of negligence. And is it not true that in any sector of life and or business, any time you encounter laziness, in any sector, right, of life and business, what does it always convey to you about the individual? That they do not care. Right? That they don't care. And Paul says here, as Christian people, we are not to lag behind. We are not to be lagging in diligence. As Christian people, listen to me this morning. It's okay to get tired. You should get tired serving God. You should. You should. You read about Martin Luther when he was translating the New Testament in German as he was in, in, in that castle, and he did it within a 30-day period, and he worked himself to the point where during this time he was coughing up blood, and he would go to bed, and his prayer before he went to bed was simply, God, I'm tired. It's okay to get tired when you're serving God. It's okay to come to a season where you're tired, right? But it's never okay to get lazy serving God. It's never okay to lose diligence. It's never okay to get to a place of indifference or a place of carelessness or a, a place of simply being complacent or lukewarm. It's never okay. It's good to get tired serving God. You should be weary. How many understand when you get to the end of a work day, you're 
your body ought to be tired. You know why? Because you've been working. You've been doing something you should be doing. You've been productive, right? And you should get tired. And there's a time in the life of the Christian where it is okay to be tired. But it's never okay. Never okay to be complacent. Lagging in diligence. Because I want to say to you this morning, the enemy's never complacent in his fight against you. He's never. He walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He never gets complacent. I think one of the greatest upsets that ever happened within the boxing world was when Mike Tyson, Iron Mike, went to fight a man by the name of Buster Douglas. Nobody thought Buster Douglas was going to win that fight. But you know what? Buster Douglas won that fight. And you know why Buster Douglas won that fight? Because Mike Tyson did not train like it was a big deal. Right? He just went in there thinking, hey... I'm Mike Tyson, right? He did not keep up that diligence with the training, right? And the next thing you know, he got knocked out by Buster Douglas, one of the greatest upsets in boxing history. And I'm telling you this morning, you are never to get to a place where you get complacent in serving the Lord. You have a real enemy that will knock you for a loop if you get lazy spiritually. He's waiting on it. He prowls about waiting for you to get that way. It's okay to get tired. But it's not okay to get complacent. We read all these exhortations in the Word of God and Scripture, warnings about warnings about the that type of attitude of complacency or indifference or carelessness. In Amos six and verse one, here's what it says. Woe to you who are at ease in Zion and trust in Mount Samaria, notable persons in the chief nation to whom the house of Israel comes. Zephaniah 1 and verse 12 says, And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish the men who are settled in complacency who say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do evil. We read, and listen to this. The prophet Ezekiel pulls back the curtain on the sin of Sodom. We know about Sodom, right? We know about Gomorrah. We know about the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. But Ezekiel pulls back the curtain and shows us what was behind the sin And it says in Ezekiel 16 and verse 49, Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Man. What's that a description of, church? (laughs) What's that a description of? Pride fullness of food, and an abundance of idleness. It says here, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. God cannot stand complacency when it comes to your walk with Him. There's a lot of things God tolerates. You know that? There's a lot of things that God tolerates, but that's not one of them. We're going to look at a verse here in a moment. But we are never to become lazy serving the Lord. Never to become slothful. Never to become indifferent. Never to become careless. Never to get to that state. And if you do, it's time to fast. 
If you do, it's time to get stuff out. If you do, it's time to get back to the altar. Because when you get in that condition, it is a dangerous condition. It is a dangerous place to be. It's time to call for the sackcloth, right? It's time to call for the ashes. It's time to get back. Anytime you get to that place, I believe sincerely that it's a spirit. It's a spirit of stupor. We talked about it this morning in our Sunday school class. Almost how many years now? 22 years ago, three planes flew into buildings within this nation. Right? And we had a brief period two to three week period of revival or, or churches had, had people coming into them to pray, a, a small awakening, but it did not last. It's like a spirit of stupor. But this stupor is on the church. We're drunk with the cup in the hand of the whore of Babylon. Right? Things of this world, we're drunk on them. We're full of them. And it's brought about a stupor on the body of Christ. I think it's a spirit. And it needs to be driven out. Amen? Amen? We read in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11. It says, And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Imitate, man, okay. Don't imitate the spiritually lazy. Isn't that always what people seem to do, though? Isn't it always what people... Isn't it always? I'm not as bad as so-and-so. So-and-so lays out there. So-and-so don't get involved there. So-and-so don't think it's a big deal to do that. So-and-so, and it's always the spiritually lazy that people intimidate. But the Word of God says, imitate those who inherit the promises. Amen? Imitate those who are on fire for God. Imitate them. Let that be your model. Let that be the thing that you pattern yourself after. Amen? Amen. It's never okay to become spiritually lazy. Say it with me. It's never okay to become spiritually lazy. Turn with me to Revelation 3. And this ought to, if you're here wavering between two opinions, this ought to drive it from you once and for all. Revelation 3 and verse 14. I didn't tell you this one, RJ, so don't worry about it. Revelation 3, verse 14. To the angel, or literally the messenger of the church of the Laodiceans, write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Lukewarmness makes Christ sick. It makes him sick. Rich. He's 
That's what they say in verse 17. Because I'm rich. You say I, I am rich. Have become wealthy and have need of nothing. Do you not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked? I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich in white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. It's never okay, never okay to become lazy spiritually it's never okay amen you ought to be able you ought to be able to tell what the symptoms are when that happens amen you ought to know what the symptoms are when this begins to happen. Amen? You know when you start to not feel good, don't you? Usually get a little itch in the back of your throat. Usually feel a little bit tired when you wake up in the morning. Maybe get a headache and you start to know, you start to see symptoms, right? And then you know. You know just by your own self observation, hey, Something's not right here. You, you know that, don't you? And there are symptoms when this starts to happen in your life. Right? There are symptoms. And you need to know, and we're going to talk about them here in a moment. But it's never okay to become lazy spiritually. Secondly, here's what we see. This is the second point. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Here's the second thing, second point right from the text. Be fervent, serving God. Be fervent, serving God. Be fervent. Be fervent. Here it is. It's stated explicitly how we are to serve God with fervency. There's a man we read about in the book of Acts named Apollos. And here's a description given of Apollos. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit. Apollos was fervent in spirit. He was somebody with, with the term... Anybody ever heard the term, he's ate up? You ever heard that term, he's ate up? There's a lot... There, hey, listen to me. There are people in here ate up with stuff, Right? There are people, I used to work for a boss that w was a metallurgist, and he would get worked up talking about stress strain curves and all this stuff to do with steel. He'd be talking to us, and he, man, this guy would get excited. The minute you start talking about that, the minute you start talking about steel and metallurgy, this guy, you, I mean, you would have thought he was preaching a sermon because he was getting so excited because he was what? Ate up with it, right? He was ate up with it. There was a fervor there that, that came out whenever you started talking about that. Now, there's some fervor in this house. I know there is. Is. The minute you start talking about the Bengals, man, there's a fervor, right? There's a fervor, right? There, it, you're ate up with it. You know all about it. You know the starting roster. You know who's hurt. You know who's not going to play. You know this. You know that. There's a fervor there. You get people talking about certain video games. There's a fervor there. There's something that comes out. You get people, oh my goodness, talking about Fox News and politics, and there's a fervor, right? There's a red redness in their face. There's their hearts beating. There's a fervor there. But then when you want get them to talk about the things of God, what do they do? They get quiet, right? Because they are not ate up with it, right? It's not in there. If it was in there, it would start coming out in their conduct and their conversation. But it's not in there. And the house of God and the things of God are a jolt that you get once a week or twice a week and you walk back out and you don't think on heavenly things. You don't think on things 
things of the Spirit because as soon as you get out, you start talking about this or thinking about this. But I'm telling you, church, we are to be ate up with the things of God. We are to be fervent serving the Lord. Amen. Amen. It's the only way you're ever going to win anybody. I've never known a soul winner to be different. Never known somebody to make an impact on eternity who just did not give a rip. Did you? Do you? Tell me one. Tell me one. We're to be ate up with it. Ate up with it. You know how I know that? Word of God says, not be drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but to be filled with the Holy Spirit speaking to one another in hymns, psalms, spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Colossians chapter 3 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let it dwell in you richly. Speaking to one another, there's that thing, there's that, there's that outward, it comes out. It comes out speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, making melody to your heart in the Lord. That's, that's the overflow, right, of what you're ate up with. What you are filled with will come out. It will spill out, won't it? It will. And we're to be fervent fervent serving the Lord. Jesus Christ is our example. You think Jesus was ever lukewarm? You think Jesus was ever lukewarm? No. He came to Jerusalem, walked into the temple. He saw people in there trading and selling. What did he do? Did he go, oh, well, hey, people are people. They got their, oh, well, that's just how it is. Oh, well. No, what did he do? He made a cord. He made a whip. He went in there and he flipped over the money changers' tables. He wouldn't let, let people walk in there carrying those doves. He said, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. In John chapter 2, it says, then his disciples remembered, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Zeal for your house. Speaking of Jesus, he was ate up with zeal for the house of God. That's our example. You see him in the book of Revelation. What does it say? He has eyes like a flame of fire. Does that speak of indifference to anybody? When he's got eyes like a flame of fire, right? The Holy Ghost came and two things took place. Fire and wind, right? Came down in the house, amen? He's a purifying fire. Does that speak of indifference? Does that speak of being lukewarm? No. Ate up. Fervent. We read... This verse here tells us to be fervent in spirit. It's the Greek word, I love this. It's zeo. And it literally means to boil. To boil. To be a flame. To boil. Fervent. Boiling. Serving God. Boiling. To be hot, To be fired up. A life that is a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God. Shining lights. Burning lamps in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Burning on fire for the Lord.
This morning, would you say that describes you? Would you say that Zeo, that fervency, you're boiling, boiling? Hey, it's okay to get tired serving the Lord, right? It's okay. Never okay to get lukewarm. Never okay to get indifferent. Never okay to get complacent. It's okay to get tired. But would you say that describes you? Is it Zeo? Are you burning for the Lord? Are you boiling? Are you ate up with zeal for the Lord? Would you say that? Something must have happened in the life of Timothy for Paul to write in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 6, I remind you, Timothy, stir up the gift of God. Fan it into flame. Something must have happened for Paul to write that. Stir it up. Fan it into flame, right? We read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that we are not to quench the Holy Spirit. And that literally means don't put out the Spirit's fire. Don't put out His fire. Don't douse it. Don't put it out. Don't put it out. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. Would you say this morning that Zeo describes you fervent? Would you say that? Would you say fervent? Would you say that? If you can't, it should. And that's God's will for you. Don't look at anybody else. That's God's will for me. That's God's will for you. That's God's will for you. Amen? Fervent. Zeo, boiling. Ate up. Zeal. On fire. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army in England. If you ever want to read stories of the Holy Spirit moving, just read the accounts of the early days of the Salvation Army. Read about the ministry of William Booth. And you'll see, you'll see signs and wonders. God help you if you don't believe that the Holy Spirit still moves. God help you. There's nothing that can be done for you. If you don't believe that the Holy Spirit still moves like he did in the book of Acts, God help you. You will never see it happen. You'll never see it happen. God help you. But I still believe he does that. I still believe that demons go out of people. I still believe, I still believe that he heals people. Instantly, I still believe that he baptizes in the Holy Spirit and that it is a separate work apart from new birth. Amen. And I believe that we are to seek it, we are to pray for it, and let him do what he wants to do in our life. I still believe that. I still believe that handkerchiefs can be taken off of people's body, even though it was unusual for the Apostle Paul, right? It was an unusual miracle. I still believe God moves like that. I still believe that God can speak to somebody and tell them, don't go there. Go over here. I still believe all of that. Amen. Amen. William Booth saw God move in those ways and he wrote this song. Listen to this. We might have sang it here a long time ago. I think we did. I got a weird memory when it comes to this stuff. In May of 2020, I remember singing this song, me and Stacy. But here's what it says. Thou Christ of burning, cleansing flame, send the fire. Send the fire. Send the fire. Thy blood-bought gift today we claim. Send the fire. Send the fire. Look down and see this waiting host and send the promised Holy Ghost. We want another Pentecost. Send the fire, send the fire, send the fire. Amen. Amen. You know what I believe happens when God does that, when people get hungry like that? You know what I believe happens? I believe He sends the fire. 
Amen. I believe he does. I believe he does. I believe he will. Amen. How many want to be fervent for the Lord? Fervent. Zeo. Boiling. Boiling. Boiling for the Lord. Here's what needs to happen. Here's what I believe needs to happen in our life today. There needs to be a no holds barred, a without reservation, a not holding on to anything, an attitude that says, I'm all yours. There needs to be a fresh surrender to the Lord. Like climbing up on the altar, saying, God, I'm yours. That has to happen. You read in the, in the temple. The temple had the compartments when you walked in, had the outer court where you had the altar for sacrifice. Then you had the cleansing where you had the sea where the priest would wash. And then you would enter in. It was called the holy place. And in the holy place you had the table of showbread. You had the the light, the menorah. And the light was always to be burning. Fresh bread was set on that table week after week. Fresh bread each week. The fire burning all the time. You'd go closer and there'd be another altar, a smaller altar. And on that would be a fire and you would place incense on that altar. And fire would go up from the veil. They would go in there at the hour of prayer. Incense would be offered and then they would go into the holy place. In the holy place, it's interesting that the representation of the glory of God in the Old Testament was what? What rested over top of the ark? The Shekinah. Represented by what? Fire. Right? Then you would have, here's where we're getting to, you would have around these temple, this temple storerooms. Right? All these different rooms that were built alongside of this temple that had storerooms where they would keep this and keep that. Then we read during the time of the prophet Ezekiel and Jeremiah that there was a day when Ezekiel saw the glory of God leave the temple. And there's a description that said that they had weavings and idols and all of these false things within the temple, the storerooms, they actually practiced prostitution within those storerooms that were supposed to be storerooms for the ministry of the temple, but now they were ate up with idols. There was prostitution going on. There were weavings to these false gods. There were idols in the very courts of God's house. And every time... Every time there was a revival within Israel, whether it be Hezekiah, whether it be Jehoshaphat, whether it be Josiah, do you know what they did with the temple? The first thing that they did, the first thing is they got everything out of that temple that shouldn't have been there. Right? They got it all out. They got rid of it. So the glory could come back. Amen. You can take this for what it is, but I believe this morning that there are stuff in the storerooms of our hearts that is keeping the glory of God from coming into our life. 
There are things that you have held on to that are there. They're in a storeroom and you won't let them go. And the glory won't come until you let them go. Amen. God wants everyone to be a carrier of his glory. You believe that? He wants you to carry his glory everywhere you go. You're the temple of the Holy Ghost. You should have the fire, the zeo. You should be boiling, right? So the first thing we got to do, there's got to be a fresh surrender. We've got to say, God, go into every room, go into every compartment, go everywhere and get it out. Get whatever out, get, get it out. Whether it be pride, whether it be unforgiveness, whether it be some secret lust that you're holding on to, something you're doing, whatever it is, you've got to get it out. Amen? Amen. We've got to. I don't know about you, I want to be on fire for God. I mean it, I mean it. I mean it. I mean that. I'm not just saying that. I'm so tired, so tired of phony nonsense done in the name of Jesus. I want the real thing or I don't want it at all. Amen? And I know that the minute we come to God and we say, God, I'm all yours, He'll come in. I know He will. I know he will. I know he will. But there has to be a fresh surrender. There has to be, secondly, a renewed devotion. A renewed devotion. Lord loves you so much with an unfailing, unconditional love. He loves us more than what our minds can even comprehend. More than what we can even fathom. Oh, the height and depth. The love of God. Paul prayed that the Ephesian church would be able to even comprehend it. It's so vast. It's so big. And we need to remember how much the Lord loves us and come to Him with a renewed devotion. A renewed devotion saying, God, I'm yours. One of the symptoms that I know, I know, is a symptom of a spiritual cold where you've gotten lukewarm as you stop praying. You stop praying. You don't pray anymore. where you don't pray, you don't spend time with God. That's a symptom. That's a symptom that you know when you can neglect prayer and not even feel bad about it. That's a symptom. Right? When you're not studying the Word anymore or the Word just becomes a utility to you, like a rabbit's foot. When you start to feel down, well, I go to my Bible when I start to no, know it's not a utility. Oh, thank God there's encouragement when we do that, but it's your life. It's your meat. It's your drink. Right? It's your meat. It's your drink. It's your daily bread. It's your sustenance. Amen? When we begin to neglect that. When we stop dealing with sin in our own life, we stop, when we make excuses for sin, we say, oh, God understands. No. Yes, he does understand, and he calls you to repent. He understands it completely, and he calls you to repent. Right? When we harbor within us things that we know are displeasing to him, and we don't deal with them, that's a sign we need that there's a sickness. Amen? When we lose sight of the purpose of our calling to win the lost, to love each other, that's a sign. We need fervency to come back. We need that fire. Amen? This morning I want to ask you, do you want that fire? Do you want to be on fire? Do you want to be? Do you want to be? Do you want to be on fire? Do you want to be boiling, not lagging in diligence, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Zeo boiling over. 
Amen? If you want that fire, stand with me. You want to be on fire, stand. Stand all across this place. I don't know what that fourth song Stacy was going to sing was, but I'm going to ask her to sing the song she was singing before I started preaching. Because I think it describes what we need. Amen? Amen. We need fire. Listen to this other part from this song, Send the Fire. It says, To burn up every trace of sin. Man, I get so tired of hearing people act like we can't have victory over sin. I get so tired. Well, I'm just a saved sinner. And then we have excuses for why we allow little sins in our life. I get so tired of hearing that. That's so foreign to the New Testament. You're to kill your sin. You're not to tolerate it. You're to put it to death. If it crops back up, you confess it, kill it. Don't give it any life. We're not to be like, well, I'm just a sinner. God knows I'm just so weak. Yes, that is true. He knows our weakness. But I'm telling you, we are never to become indifferent when it comes to fighting sin. Send the fire to burn up every trace of sin. Amen? Amen. This morning we're going to pray. We're going to start with a fresh surrender. Has to. We got to get them storerooms cleaned out. We do. We got to get them cleaned out. I'm going to say this to you, and I'm not saying this to scare you, but you might be afflicted by an evil spirit. You only give the devil access by tolerated sin. Ephesians chapter 4 tells us don't give him a foothold. That is, don't give him a place. And that means you can literally give him a place in your life. He can come into your life. He can come in. I know we're born again. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. I know that we can't be possessed by the devil, but I'm telling you right now, you can be oppressed and afflicted, and you may be carrying around with you a stronghold right now that the enemy has a grab on right now. And you need delivered. There are some you think it's just your flesh, but no, it's beyond that. It is a plaguing thing that you can't get free from. And it needs to just be driven out. Amen? And right now, we as the body of Christ right now, as God's people, we need a fresh surrender and we need to ask the Lord, God, clean out every room. Amen? I don't want any room harboring the weavings or the offerings to a false God. Right? And we need to do that now. Amen? Would you join me up at this altar? Join me at this altar. You can come up and sit in the front row if you want to sit. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy.
holy, holy. This is going to sound... Who in here is not familiar with speaking in tongues? No, no, no. Here's what I'm saying. You don't, you've never seen it. You don't know what it is. Everybody in here informed on what speaking in tongues is? All right? Nobody's going to think we're crazy. It says if an outsider comes in, and, but there's no outsiders this morning, right? I want some of you to pray in the Holy Spirit, okay? As the Spirit leads you, openly. Right now, this is a spiritual battle right now. I really feel it right now. I want you to pray. Pray in the Spirit for those who are here. And as we pray, I want you, all of you, to say to the Lord, God, have it all. Take it all. Search every room. Search every area of my heart. Take it. Get anything out of me that should not be in me. Anything out of me. Whatever I've opened myself up to, whatever I've tolerated, get it out. Get it out. Can we do that right now? Let's do that. Let's pray. Some of you pray in the Holy Ghost. out every single area of our hearts, Lord, every room. God, come right now. Drive anything out that is not of you, God. Drive anything out, Lord, that should not be in our life. Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus over your church and over your people, God. Lord, if they've opened themselves up to things that they should not have opened themselves up to, God, and a place has been given to the wicked one, Lord, right now, we kick him out. We evict him, Lord. We ask you to drive him out, God. Bring deliverance, Lord. Set at liberty those who seem like they're bound and wrapped up. Do it right now, God. Do it right now, God. Do it right now, God. Lord, drive it out. Expose whatever is there. If something is there, God, expose it. Holy Ghost, come. Come. Come, Holy Spirit. Come. Come. God, drive out the spirit of stupor. God, drive out the spirit of complacency. God, drive out the spirit of compromise. Drive out the spirit of perversion. God, drive out the spirit of pride. God, drive out the spirit of lust. God, drive it out. Drive it out. Clean it out, God. Clean it out, God. Lord, anything in us, not of you, anything in us, God, Anything, God, where there is a stronghold, clean it out, God. Clean it out. Clean it out. Clean it out. Oh, God, clean it out. Purge it from us, God. Purge it from us, God. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Clean it out. Offer yourself before the Lord now. Lay yourself on the altar. God, here's my life. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, God. Take my life. It's Yours. My silver, my gold, my time. My energy, God, it's yours. It's yours. Do with me what you want to do. Our life is a living sacrifice, God. Lord, do with us what you want to do. Raise your hands with me this morning. And let's ask God. 
us in the fire. That we would be fervent. That we would be zeo boiling in service to the Lord. Zeo boiling, zealous in serving the Lord. Lord, right now we ask you to send the fire. Oh, that we would be fervent. You said to those who were lukewarm, you said to be zealous and repent. That means fire. Right now, I pray that you would make us zealous for you. Send the fire. Send the fire. Oh, Holy Ghost, come. Come and fall on us as your people. Come and fall on us, God. Send the fire. Send the fire, God. Let it burn in us, God. Let it burn in our hearts. Let it burn in us, God. Let there be a fresh fire fall on us, Lord. Don't let us be the same, God. Don't let us be indifferent. Don't let us be callous, God. But Lord, let a fresh fire burn on the inside of us, Lord. By the power of your Spirit, we pray today in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Holy, holy. Yes, God. Praise you, Lord. Fresh fire. Fresh, fresh fire. I want what you desire. I'm gonna burn for you. Give me a fresh, fresh fire. Yes, God. Give me a fresh, fresh fire. I want what you desire. I wanna burn. Yes, God. Each breath that I breathe. Praise you, Lord. Ask Him this morning. Each moment I'm giving. Give you a fresh fire. God, if I live, I live for you. Yes. Holy, holy, holy. I love your presence. You're my obsession. Yes, Lord. Give me a fresh, fresh fire. Give me a fresh, fresh fire. I want what you desire. I want a burn for you. Give me a fresh, fresh fire. Give me a fresh, fresh fire. You desire, I want to burn for you. Get with somebody next to you. Get with somebody. Put your hands on one another's shoulder. Or hold hands, whatever you want to do. Let's pray for each other. Oh, God, send the fire. Oh, God, send the fire. Lord, I pray for my brothers, for my sisters, the redeemed of the Lord. You love them, God. You love us with an unfailing, unchanging love. And God, you're coming back, your word says, for a bride without spot or without blemish. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and my sisters. God, I pray that they would go deeper than they've ever gone in their walk with you. God, that they would burn hotter than they've ever burned before in their walk with you. God, that they would hunger for you like they've never hungered before. God, that there would be a thirst and an appetite for spiritual things, for the things of the kingdom, God, like they've never had before. I pray, God, I pray, Lord, that you would fill them up to overflowing. God, that a fresh anointing, fresh oil, fresh fire would fall upon us as we offer up our lives to you, God. Let a fresh anointing and fresh fire fall. God, do this in my brothers and my sisters. Do this, I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 At some point, we'll take up a normal offering. 
But if, if our ushers would come up here, just stand, just stand up here. If you got an offering, come and put it up here. If you got an offering, just Gary and Buddy are gonna just come and bring your offering. Just come right now if you got one. Tonight we have church at 6 o'clock. If Lord wills, I'm going to preach on a, a verse I think that we need to hear in America right now. 2, Corinthians, or 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, seek my face, then, then will I hear from heaven. Amen. Tonight at 6 o'clock, let's pray, we'll be dismissed. Lord, thank you so much for your word, for the power of your spirit. God, thank you that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Thank you, Lord. God, now I pray you go with your people. God, that you would bless them and bring us back together to worship you and receive all that you have for us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning in our time of worship and the Word. And I would encourage you, if you need anything, if you need prayer or whatever you may need, we are here for you. And I want to personally encourage you to reach out to us with any prayer requests or, or questions that you may have about the Lord. Thank you and have a blessed day.